Hi everyone. Okay, moving along to the next lesson here. Um, I want you to add this slide and you don't actually have this in your note frame. So if you had chosen to print out the PowerPoint note frames, you're, you're going to add this one in here. Um, just a reminder that like dissolves like. Some of you will have heard this expression before. It's something people say. Um, not sure who these people are, but some people say it. Um, this means the polar molecules dissolve polar molecules, non-polar molecules dissolve non-polar molecules. So that's why some things um, you can dissolve in water, but not alcohol or vice versa. Sometimes, you know, certain inks won't dissolve in water, they're permanent markers, but if you put them in alcohol, you see them dissolve. Okay, so make sure you have that information there. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about the solubility of gases here. So when you dissolve a gas in a liquid, um, sometimes people sort of have trouble grasping that concept, but every time we have a pop can, uh, you're, you're, you're drinking uh, carbon dioxide that was dissolved in a liquid there. Um, anyways, the solubility for gases always is going to decrease when temperature increases. So if we look here, as temperature is getting hotter, the solubility of these gases, this is just showing CO2 and oxygen gas, are it's clearly going down. Um, and that is always true for all gases. Now, this is because if we increase the temperature, we've increased the kinetic energy. Um, that means particles are going to move more, you're gonna break IMFs, and it's going to allow the gases to gain enough energy that they're going to escape the system. Um, so for example, soda pop or soft drinks, whatever, that has been, if it's been sitting at open at room temperature, it's going to be flat as the carbon dioxide has come out of solution. So because these get warm, so when the temperature increases as they get warm, the gases inside of them become less soluble and they're going to leave the system. It's also linked to pressure, and we'll talk about that in a minute here. Um, actually, we'll talk about it right now. Uh, so with a change in pressure, liquids and solids show no sign, no, sorry. With a change in pressure, liquids and solids are going to show no change in solubility. So if you're trying to dissolve a solid or a liquid into something, it really doesn't matter what the pressure is. However, that changes when you have gases. Um, so gases are going to increase in solubility with an increase in pressure. And basically this diagram really shows it well. Um, so we've got the first situation here. Uh, so the, this is a container with a movable piston. So as you have lots of space in here, these are the gas particles here and they're sitting above the solution. This is my liquid state here. This is my gas state here. Now, if you increase the pressure, now I've increased the pressure here by decreasing the volume, but same thing, you're going to increase the pressure. And what that does is it forces the gas particles, more of them into the solution. So it forces them to be dissolved inside of that liquid. So more gas molecules are soluble at the higher pressure. So this is increased pressure here. Um, now, carbonated beverages, again, provide the best example of this phenomena. So all carbonated beverages, so carbonated beverages are fizzy ones, right? Um, they're all bottled under pressure to increase the carbon dioxide dissolved in the solution. So when you when the, you open the, the can, the soda can, or when you open the, the bottle of soft drink, the pressure above the solution decreases, and as a result, the solution effervesces. So this effervesces just means bubbles here. And some of the carbon dioxide bubbles off. And, and we've all seen that when you open a can, you get that pssst sound, right? That is the gas escaping the system. Um, so a little question here. So champagne, um, and of course, none of you are 18. So no one has had champagne, of course. Um, champagne is a bubbly type of wine, basically. So champagne continues to ferment. So ferment fermentation is when um, we're getting the production of alcohol, but it also causes carbonation um, to ferment in the bottle. So the fermentation pr produces carbon dioxide gas. So why is the cork wired on a bottle of champagne? Uh, yeah, the cork is actually in the bottle and it's wired. Um, and the answer is as more carbon dioxide is formed, the pressure of the gas increases. So the wires to prevent the cork from blowing off. And so we've most of us have seen in TV shows, movies, whatever, we've seen that cork blasting off from uh, 
from a champagne bottle. Some of you may have experienced that in real life. It's, uh, it's impressive when it happens. <laughs> now, a little quiz here. If a diver had the bends, describe how this can be treated. So I think we talked about this before. Um, so this is when a diver is down at a deep, um, so the divers down here, this is my water level and they're down here. Um, and then, oh, they have no arms. There we go. And then say they're running out of gas. So they're running out of air. So they are, oh, that was supposed to be a frown. They are not happy. They're running out of gas. Um, if they move to the surface too quickly, what happens is the pressure is going to decrease. Um, and so that gas inside their lungs is going to come out of solution. It's going to go into their soft tissues. And um, that's not a good thing <laughs> when that happens. Um, so it's going to end up being solved in the soft tissues, which is not good. Um, how can, actually, let me just, so how this was discovered was actually Boyle. This is actually a very dark story. So Robert Boyle had this container. He had like a bell jar. So this is a bell jar here. And what he did was he put a snake inside of it. Um, oh, I can't draw a snake. And then it's gonna be coiled up. Let's have our snake coiled up here. That's a snake in there. Um, and then he can he attached it to a vacuum hose. So this is a pump system here. So he's got a pump system here, and he attached this bell jar to it. But what he did was he put the plunger up in it. So what was that? That was decreasing the oxygen inside of the bell jar. So what he did is he created a system of very low pressure. Um, so low pressure could, because he was removing the air. Well, the snake, of course, started going crazy in there, which is not cool and animal cruelty and that scientific experiment would never pass today. Um, but back then it did. And what they ended up happening was um, he saw bubbles of gas being produced. So in the snake eyes, so there's my snake. <laughs> so snakes have a tongue, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> in the soft tissue of the eyes, so the corner of the eyes of the snake, he started to see these little gas bubbles being produced. Um, and so he was, Robert Boyle was the first one who sort of noticed um, this concept of, of what we call as the bends. And so the gas was, was because the pressure was low, the gas was coming out of solution. It was, it was, it was not dissolved anymore. And so it was coming out in the soft tissues. And this happens in, in humans as well. Um, if you do a little bit of research on it, there's people who uh, were building the Golden Gate Bridge. And so they were deep under the earth um, getting the piles built for the for the bridge and then they would come rise to the surface too soon and when they did that they were having all this really bad pain and agony and sickness and and it was the bends um anyways so if you have the bends so how can it be treated so basically you get the bends because you've 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 lowered the the pressure too quickly and, and you're you're out of sync um, so how you would combat that is decompression chambers. Um, so you would put a high pressure, so you'd put yourself back under a high pressure, force that gas back into the solution, and then gradually you're gonna lower the pressure over time, and then you're hopefully going to equilibrate so you could try to, to get away from that. So the bends can be fatal, so um, it's something that you can die from, so it's definitely something to be careful of, which is why I will never be a scuba diver too dangerous um, okay little question here I think you might have the answers already on your page if you have the notes there um, the amount of dissolved oxygen in a mountain lake at 10,000 feet so this is a quite high elevation in the mountains and 50 degrees Fahrenheit is blank than the amount of dissolved oxygen in a lake near sea level at 50 degrees Fahrenheit now, people sometimes don't realize that there's oxygen gas dissolved in all of our bodies of water, and that is how our aquatic life uh, lives. It needs the oxygen. Um, so basically, this is a question asking, is the dissolved oxygen level higher at a high elevation or at a low elevation? So you are comparing 
pressures. Remember, we have already talked about pressures um, as it relates to altitude in our first unit when we talked about uh, the boiling point on top of a mountain, for example. Um, so I'll give you a second to think about that. Okay, so you are going to have less dissolved oxygen in the water at higher altitudes because there's less pressure. Um, at sea level, um, there's going to be an increased pressure level and that is going to cause there to be more dissolved oxygen uh, or, dissol or oxygen pushed into the solution, pushed into the water. Um, next question here. A Coke at room temperature will have blank carbon dioxide in the gas space above the liquid than an ice cold bottle. So this would be more or less would be um, your question here. Um, so the answer, it's going to have more gas than one at ice cold because the warm Coke can hold less um, of the gas in solution. So basically you've got a Coke can, right? Now, as that temperature warms, if you increase the temperature here, that means like, like there's always a little bit of space at the top, right, for gas. Um, as you increase the temperature, more of the oxygen is going to come out of solution and sit on top there. It's gonna sit on top in that area there. Okay, good. Um, okay, so there is one bonus bonus assignment for this course. Now, generally speaking, it's it's really only going to make a difference if you're someone who's sort of 70% or lower. So if you're sitting at 70% and higher, I would not actually recommend doing this unless you just want to for curiosity's sake. Um, but it typically won't help your grade a whole lot. Um, the topic is going to be thermal pollution. So what I require is a three-page research paper on thermal pollution. You need to include references. Uh, don't plagiarize because I won't give you any marks for that. I remember one time someone handed in this paper and they actually literally still had all the hyperlinks in the document. <laughs> it's like, wow, you cut and pasted that from Wikipedia. Um, so don't do that. Uh, so you can do this. I will still talk about thermal pollution in the next slide here. But um, this is the bonus assignment, and the due date for it is the day of the exam, which we don't know yet, but it'll be during exam week. We haven't changed the exam week, so uh, we'll figure that out when we do that. Okay, and I'll let you know about that. Uh, so thermal pollution, that's your bonus assignment. Now, what is thermal pollution? Uh, I'm going to draw it out here. So, so we've got this is a large body of water say that's like a giant lake like a great lake or something um what ends up happening is sometimes we have um industry build on the lakes right so we've got these big let's say those are big reactors and you see this in nuclear power plants too so we've got these large reactors sitting next to big bodies of water um now the reason why they're there um, is because they they can use the water to cool down the reactions now a lot of reactions are exothermic right which means they produce heat now if you have a giant um, reactor like these and you've got it full of, of something that you've reacted so you've created or made this chemical um, and it's at a very hot temperature so let's make this hot you need to find a way to cool that down quickly so that you can use it. Um, that's easier said than done. Water, liquids maintain their heat really well, uh, which is why oceans don't freeze, right? Um, so we need to, or they need to find a way to quickly cool down their processes. So what they do is they build a second container around it. And then what they can do is they can pump the water, yeah, pump the water from the lake through here. So the water is going to come up and around. Now, what's happening when that, when that goes? It's not touching any of the chemicals, right? But what it's doing is it's making this, um, instead of being hot now it's cool because there's a transfer of heat so the cold water on the outside is taking the heat from this reactor here and then it's being deposited back now when it's pumped back into the lake 
what that's going to do is it's going to raise the temperature. So thermal pollution, you're raising the temperature. So the overall temperature of this giant body of water is going to increase. So why is that a problem? So people will be like, well, what's the big deal? You're not adding any pollution. Well, technically you're not adding any pollution in terms of there's no new substances being added, but you are adding heat. Now, why that's a problem is related, or well, not related, it, it is because of the solubility of gases. Uh, so again, we've got oxygen gas inside of this large body of water, which supports aquatic life inside of that body of water. As the temperatures increase, less of that oxygen is going to be dissolved because it's going to become less soluble. So oxygen gas is going to leave the system. It's going to leave this body of water. As we have less oxygen, what happens to aquatic life? Aquatic life is very sad. Aquatic life will die, right? Dead. Um, they need the certain levels of dissolved oxygen in order to thrive. So one thing to remember is, you know, this is an ecosystem bunch of you have taken biology you know about ecosystems this is an ecosystem as we increase the temperature and change it all you're changing that ecosystem and um, a temperature and dissolved oxygen those are integral parts of that so major changes here okay so that's thermal pollution so make sure you have a rough idea of what thermal pollution is um, and then again that bonus assignment if you choose to do it all right um, okay, next topic we're going to talk about is called freezing point depression. So we all know that that certain substances will freeze as a certain temperature. Um, so water, for example, freezes at zero degrees Celsius, right? So when we talk about freezing point depression, we're talking about lowering the freezing point. Um, so this happens when the freezing point is lowered and we do that by adding a solute to a solvent. So if you've ever wondered, um, why we put salt on our roads to melt the ice or why you put salt on your sidewalks to melt the ice, this is why. So in order for a liquid to freeze, it must achieve a very ordered state that results in the formation of a crystal. So remember we talked about a crystal lattice and things like that. If there are impurities, this would be the solute in the liquids, this is when you put the salt on the ice, for example, the liquid is less ordered, so therefore the solution is now more difficult to freeze and a lower temperature is required. So that is why when you add salt to ice, it melts it because it needs a much lower temperature in order to freeze. Um, now, which decreases freezing point more? It depends on what solute you're putting in there. So which one do you think is going to decrease it more? The sodium chloride or the calcium chloride? Um, yeah, so those are my two reactions there. So there is going to be a difference. And which one has more particles in the, in the dissociation side, on the product side? Yeah, this one has more products, right? So it is actually going to lower the freezing point more than just the salt because it's got more particles to kind of mess it up right to make it difficult good we also have something called boiling point elevation so again water boils at 100 degrees celsius and we can elevate that by doing things now we tend to put um anyone who sort of cooks you'll know you put salt in your water um, there's various reasons for that. It could be a taste thing too, but it's also to get the, the temperature hotter too. So review the vapor pressure. So the vapor pressure again uh, is the pressure at which a liquid is in equilibrium with its vapor. Um, now boiling is the temperature at which the vapor pressure equals the pressure above the liquid. And this is where, if we were in class, I would get you to all two three four i can't count my fingers this is where i'd say it's the two hands meeting right when they meet that is the boiling point and this is p atmosphere and this is p vapor here so when those two things meet each other that's going to be the boiling point so keep that in mind as we move through this um okay so if we add solute to a solvent the vapor pressure of the solution is lowered so when we lower the vapor pressure that means you're going to require a higher temperature to bring it back up to meeting the atmospheric pressure which will then uh, raise the, the boiling point 
Um, so there's three reasons why that happens. At the surface of the solution where evaporation occurs, there are fewer solvent particles due to the presence of solute particles. So this is going to lower our vapor pressure. Uh, the solute particles absorb energy and will reduce the energy available to evaporate the solvent. This also lowers the vapor pressure. And energy is required to overcome the IMFs between the solute and solvent particles. That also lowers vapor pressure. Now, if the vapor pressure is lowered, the temperature must be raised to have the vapor pressure equal the pressure above the solution. Um, so that is the key to this. Um, so for example, water is going to boil at 100 degrees Celsius. Water and salt, when you add salt to it, is going to boil at greater than 100 degrees Celsius. So why didn't I specify a certain temperature here? So why don't you know it exactly what temperature it's going to boil at? Yeah, because it will depend on how much salt you add, right? So the more salt you add um, up to the saturation point, you are going to make the boiling point higher or raise. Okay, so you need to remember, adding a solute to a solvent will lower the freezing point and it raises the boiling point. So make sure you're able to tell me why that would be a good theory question on a test, for example. Um, so boiling point raises, freezing point lowers. Now, if we were in, I left this in here, I shouldn't have, I should have just taken it out. Um, if we were in class right now, we would do an ice cream lab tomorrow, which is very sad. Um, but you know what, you could probably do it at home if you want. Um, I've actually done this lab with my own children at home. It's pretty fun. You can make ice cream um, by using freeze, the concept of freezing point depression. You simply get ice, you add a bunch of salt to it, and it makes it incredibly cold. And then you use that mixture to take the heat from, from, a, from a milk mixture to make ice cream. Anyways, I'll maybe post a link to um, that. Some people make, see, they have like ice cream making balls now. I don't know if you've seen these things where you like kick the ball around and then you it makes ice cream. That's what they're doing, it's freezing point depression. Anyways, I will post a link to, um, I'll post a link to doing that at home if you're interested. It's actually pretty cool to make ice cream at home. Uh, your assignment though is just exercise 49, it's called colligative properties, and just do questions one to four. We're not going to bother correcting it because it, it's, it's really just regurgitating what we did in class here. So if you uh, read it over, if the questions make sense to you, that's great. If not, um, send me a message and I can individually work with you guys on that one. Okay, 